This is something like a clarinet, this instrument. Uh, and in a minute I'll say how it's not a clarinet and how it is a clarinet. Uh, let me start by saying hello. I'm Bart, and I got introduced to somebody funny a moment ago, didn't I? I'm Bart Hopkins, and... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, and we'll, we, we know who I am. Um, and thank you so very much for that introduction. Some, now, I wonder who said some of those things about me. <laughs> I, I got them. You, no, I think you made those up. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with them, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, and Phil and I talked about what this, this, this talk should be called. What it really should be called is um, Selected Topics in Musical Instruments Acoustics Used as an Excuse to Show Off Some Interesting Musical Instruments. That's what we're going to be doing today. I'll be talking a little bit about reed instruments and how they work. And I'll also later on be talking about a topic which may sound obscure, but actually is quite central. And that's the subject of overtones. How overtones function in musical instruments and the sounds they create. Because it turns out that there's some very interesting things you can observe about, about that and the way overtones work. So, uh, for many years I was the editor of this journal, Experimental Musical Instruments. And in that role, Sort of anything interesting, oh yes, uh, anything interesting that anybody was doing with musical instruments, I usually ended up hearing about it. I learned an awful lot in that period of time. I hope I'm still learning, even though I'm no longer the editor. Uh, and so uh, I come here with uh, s uh, some knowledge that I sort of somehow s strugglingly gained myself, most of which came from learning about what an awful lot of other people have done in interesting ways with musical instruments. And we'll be seeing a little bit of that kind of stuff today. Okay. Is that better? No. Uh, yeah. Is it too much? No. Uh, so, um, this is, I said it's like a clarinet. That the, the main way it's like a clarinet is that the mouthpiece configuration is very much, is, is a clarinet mouthpiece. It has a clarinet reed up here. Um, and the other way it's like a clarinet is that it has a tube which is cylindrical. It's characteristic of clarinets that the tube is cylindrical. It's, it's of uniform diameter over the length. It doesn't get wider as you go along the length of it. And that actually makes a difference in the way the sound waves behave inside the tube. I can show you this pretty simply. <coughs> Saxophones <coughs> are not cylindrical. Here's a little saxophone I made. It's a wooden saxophone. Notice that it's wider at this end than at this end. And it has a distinctively saxophone-like sound. I hope this is going to blow. You know, when you first pick up a reed instrument and start blowing, it doesn't always cooperate. Let's see if this will do it. Just a moment. Your patience is appreciated. You know, the uh, symphony players are there keeping their weed wet while they're waiting for the conductor to point at them. I hope I can get this to speak without having to take a moment too long. You can hear that it really sounds like a saxophone, and the big difference is that it's wider at this end. It has a conical bore. I know it's square and not exactly a cone, but the most important thing is that it gets broader as it goes along. This one is cylindrical. It's the same diameter over its length. Now, that's how it's like a clarinet. Here's how it's not like a clarinet. It's not like a clarinet in that the uh, way that you control the pitch is quite different. Instead of having tone holes, it has, and I don't know if you can see this, it has an open slit running the length of the top of the tube, sort of hidden by this piece. There's an opening running the whole length of the tube here. As long as this piece of material is up and away, that opening is open over the entire length of the tube, and it's as if you had all the tone holes open. If I press it down here, I've just closed off this whole part of the tube. And uh, I can close here, or here, or here. And one of the great things about this system is I can gliss all over the place. I can make sliding pitches all up and down 
like a trombone or a slide whistle. But you know, if you have to bliss all the time, you get seasick pretty quick. You can also, on this instrument, play discrete pitches. So I can go like this. Or I can go like this. And one of the nice things about this is, if, we, if any of you have played reed instruments, you'll, you'll know that if there's any kind of leak anywhere in the system, the reed instrument will squeal. In other words, if this seal is not a good seal, or if you're playing a conventional clarinet and one of your tone holes has some dust in it and it's not sealing properly when you cover it, then it'll squeal. This doesn't squeal, even though you think, gee, does that make such a good seal? And the reason is that the, um, the tube is made of steel. And this thing is a, is a magnetic, uh, a, a rubberized magnet. So when I do this, it slaps shut and it, it stays shut and it doesn't leak. Now, um, at the other end of the instrument back again, here's the reed. What is a reed? I mean, a reed is called a reed because traditionally they're made out of uh, a certain kind of cane reed that works very well for the purpose. But it's more interesting to think of a reed in terms of what it does, a reed on a reed instrument. What a reed does is it covers an opening in the end of the instrument. Almost. It almost covers the opening. When you blow into it, the reed momentarily slaps shut. And then it pops back open, and then it slaps shut again. And you get an air gate effect in which the air enters the tube in a series of rapid pulses. It doesn't, instead of your continuous stream of air from your mouth, you get this series of rapid pulses. That's what sets up the vibration. If the vibration is at a certain frequency, you will hear a pitch associated with that frequency because you probably have some sense of this. The faster the vibration, the higher the note you perceive. A slow vibration, you hear a lower note. Uh, my voice is now, uh, the, the oscillations are a bit slower. And now they're fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this reed is slapping shut, maybe fast, maybe slow. What determines how fast? That's important because that determines what note you're going to hear. Well, the main thing that determines how fast in the case of a well-functioning wind instrument is, it's attached to this tube. And the tube uh, encloses an air column, and the air in that air column, depending on the length of the air column, has a natural frequency that it at wants to vibrate at. It actually has several, but we'll simplify it and say it wants to go at a certain frequency. And the way the air pressure waves go back and forth in that tube causes the reed to open and shut at the frequency associated with the tube. So the tube frequency comes to dominate the reed. The reed comes to cooperate with the tube. Without that, your reed would just be squealing around in the same way if you take the mouthpiece off your clarinet and blow like this, it just squeals. The read of the uh, tube kind of controls the frequency of the, the uh, read. Works very nicely. It's a good system when it works. When it doesn't work, you get squealing. When it works, you get something nice. Uh, so, do we have any choices about this? Can we do other kinds of reads? I mean, you, you could imagine maybe there's other kinds of air gates that can function like that. In, and in fact, there are. Here's one. There are many kinds of reeds used in familiar musical instruments. Here's one that's not used in any familiar musical instrument. I've got two tubes here. They're nicely made of bamboo in this case. A narrow t inner tube and an outer tube. The outer tube here is big enough so that there's a little airspace between the two tubes. You know, it's like the sleeve of the outer tube is big enough so it's not touching the inner tube. There's a little chamber in here, and the inner tube goes all the way through. At the top, what's that? That's a balloon. It's a latex membrane, let's say, because that sounds better than balloon. And the, the inside tube, now I don't know if you can see this, going all the way through and sort of pressing against the balloon membrane. So it's like a little drum head up here. What's going to happen if I blow into this hole, into this chamber? Where does the air go? It doesn't have any place to go unless it can sort of squeeze under the membrane and into the other tube. Well, when it goes to squeeze under that membrane, it, it doesn't do that in a steady stream. The membrane lifts, lets a puff of air through, and closes again. And then it lifts and lets a puff. And if this tube here, if the main tube here is in cooperation with the bead, then the resonant frequency of the main tube will dominate the puffing frequency of the membrane. It's the same thing as the other reed. Right? So here we have a reed, even though it's, nobody had to go to the riverside and collect a piece of uh, reed to get the reed, <laughs> it's just a balloon. Here's what it sounds like. Kind of a limited 
an instrument. It's only got uh, four notes. Four notes. The interesting history of this instrument is that somebody came back and reported to the world of American instrument makers that they had been in the island of Sumatra, <coughs> touristing, and there were little children selling these things to tourists in Sumatra. They would take a film canister, an old-fashioned film canister, you, to, to, to remember this. You, you guys are too young to remember this, but film used to come in a little plastic canister. <laughs> and they would take a film canister and fit it over a, a PVC tube take a piece of balloon or a piece of candy wrapper or something and do this. And then they'd go tooting around, driving the tourists crazy until the tourists would buy one of these instruments from it. And then when we reported this in the Experimental Musical Instrument Journal, a bunch of American makers said, that's really cool, and started making instruments like this. Here's a related one. This is a little different. I I've got a balloon on the end here. I'm going to sort of pull the edge of the balloon. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here. I'm pulling the edge of the balloon so that if I try to blow through this mouthpiece now, it, does, it can't quite go because it's pinched right here. But once again, it'll set up that pulsing mechanism, and you'll hear a pitch. A bit lower this time, as you can imagine. I'll just show you this. This is a little embarrassing because I haven't gotten anywhere with this. But just in the last, you know, little bit, I've been working on this one. This is also a piece of latex membrane. Um, the the difference between this and the ones you've already seen is that um, the membrane is very big, and the air column isn't much of an air column. This thing is not going to have a very well defined frequency. So the, the airspace is not going to do a good job of dominating the reed in this place because the airspace doesn't have a, a well-defined frequency of its own. Does that make sense? We need the well-defined frequency here to control the pulse. So I've got a reed that's just going to do its own thing. And then what I can do, this isn't going to sound like much, but what I can do is I can mess directly with the reed. I can vary the tension on the reed with my hands, or as it happens with this roll of tape. Let's see if this will work. And that's all the demonstration I'm going to do, because I haven't learned to play it yet. I think I'm going to attach it to an air compressor, and with a foot valve to control the airflow, and then I'll be able to just play it with both hands, you know, controlling the reed. And so check back with me in, you know, six months or so, and I'll either tell you, oh, it was a great success, I'm getting famous already, or I'll tell you, what? What was that? <laughs> I will have forgotten about it because it didn't work. We don't know yet. Um, I said earlier I would talk a little bit about overtones. You probably have an intuitive sense of what an overtone is. It's implied in the name. Most musical sounds, you hear them and you think, well, I can hear what pitch that note is. My mind can hear what, what note that is. B flat or C sharp. Even if you don't know what's called B flat or C sharp, you know that it, it's a certain note. Um, but almost all sounds actually have more than one frequency happening. Somehow our ears are very good at hearing the, complex, the complexity of a sound that is multiple frequencies. And <coughs> recognizing one frequency as the dominant defining frequency, and that's, that corresponds to the pitch that we hear. But there are other frequencies present, and it's very interesting to explore what's going on with those frequencies. So what, I'm going to take a minute and do that with you. Here is a string. And it's, it's a nice clear tone. Oh my gosh, I forgot to set up something I should have set up. This will only take a minute. The string is a nice clear tone. Um, and it sounds like one single pitch, well defined. In fact, there are other pitches present. And I can let you hear them. 
There's a way I can stop that main pitch from sounding and allow the other pitches to come to the forward. And if, if anybody here has played string instruments, you're probably familiar with it. I can do what's called string harmonics. I can play this main note, and now by touching it in the right place, I can prevent that main note from sounding, and you'll only hear the overtone, one of them in particular, coming to the fore. That note was in there all along, but it's subsumed into the pitch, and because it has a very close musical relationship to the main tone, with, I'll call the main tone the fundamental. It has a very close musical relationship to the fundamental. Your ear doesn't separate it out. It just feels it as part of a recipe that produces one note. I can even do this. Wait. I'm not doing a good job of it. There we go. I sounded the note, then I stopped the main tone, and the overtone continued ringing. There are other overtones present as well, like this one. Or this one. Those are all present in the string tone. Yeah, our ear gives it all as one tone. Now what I'm going to do, oh, let me explain one important thing about this. Those pitches that I just played for you, they have a kind of a coherent musical relationship. That's why they blend so well. And that's what happens when you have a well-made string. This string is, you know, manufactured by a reputable manufacturer. It's very uniform in, it's perfectly uniform just about, in mass, diameter, rigidity over its length. And that, as a result of that, those overtones have a nice coherent musical relationship to the fundamental. Uh, that relationship is called, they are harmonic. It's part, they are part of the harmonic series. Now this doesn't mean exactly that they're harmonious, but it does mean they bear a simple relationship to the fundamental, which makes them blend nicely. Um, if the tone has overtones that are not harmonic, that creates a very different situation. Now, I'm, I'm going to do something here. I just said to you, if the string is perfectly uniform, then the tones will be harmonic, and they'll blend closely. I can distort this string a little bit in a very easy way. I just put a little weight on the string, somewhere along its length. That weight means that the, the, the mass is no longer uniformly distributed along the string. The result will be that the tone of the string will no longer be harmonic, which is to say, those overtones will be in a skewed relationship relative to the fundamental. Let's hear what that sounds like. So here it is, pretty close to the, what we just heard. I'm going to take this weight, this weight I just put on it, it's right near one end. I'm going to move it a little bit away from the end. That's going to start skewing the harmonics a little bit. Let's see what this sounds like now. It's still pretty good, but there's something a little spicy about it in there. Let me get a little more perverse here. I'm going to move the weight a little farther from the end. It's a completely different sound. It's a strange thing. When the overtones line up in this particular way, it sounds completely coherent to our ears. Switch those relationships, and we get something that... You know, yeah, I hardly know what to make of it. Here again is the original tone. That's pretty close to the original tone. Here's the skewed tone. An interesting fact, our ears completely read differently. And we have this very specialized requirement. All the overtones are supposed to be lined up in a coherent way, and if they're not, we have a completely different sort of psychological, acoustic, musical response. Now, I just said that stringed instruments, assuming the strings are well made, are almost always harmonic. That's why we use them a lot. Um, Well-made wind instruments are harmonic too. The clarinet I just played and the saxophone, the overtones are nicely lined up. They're not lined up in all sounding systems. For instance, in uh, xylophone bars or marimba bars, if you just take a rectangular bar of wood and set it up so it'll vibrate nicely and whack it with a mallet of some kind, the overtones don't line up in a harmonic way. And what you usually hear is, the, let's, I'll say the fundamental again, that's the main low note. And then there are a couple of really prominent overtones that have, don't have a coherent musical relationship to the fundamental. And by hitting it in certain ways, you can really bring them out, actually. And it can be very distracting. In fact, at times it can be beyond distracting. It can be musically confusing, like your ear doesn't know which note is the right note. That can happen with something like a marimba bar. So how, how do we make marimbas sound good then? Well, you can do two, there's two ways you can make a marimba sound better. You can make, 
you can decide, oh, I like that slightly spicy off-kilter tone of having the overtones out of whack. Or you can do another operation, which is carefully reshaping the underside of the marimba bar in a way that makes the overtones line up. The traditional way that it's done, just because it sort of works conveniently with the way these bars are made, is that you scoop out the underside in a way that takes that first really prominent overtone and it puts it in a pitch that is two octaves above the fundamental. You may not know what two octaves means if you're not a musician, but what, in practice what it means is it's another tone that relates very closely to the fundamental. And suddenly what was a little incoherent becomes completely coherent. And if it's a really good marimba bar, you'll then tune the next overtone to some other pitch, maybe three octaves above. And if you're a pro, you can take it even farther than that. Here's another example. This is a little uh, demonstration instrument, really. It's a thumb piano or a kalimba or a sansa or a mbira. You know, there's an African-style instrument, an instrument that originated uh, on the continent of Africa, which uses prongs, which are rigidly fixed at one end and free to vibrate at the other. You pluck them. You know, they're usually played kind of like this. Hold it in your lap and pluck it. Like, you've probably seen these things. Um, they also are not, by nature, harmonic. The overtones tend to be out of whack. And uh, this little demonstration instrument has some uh, prongs where I just let them be their inharmonic selves. And some others where I adjusted them, I reshaped the bars a little bit to bring the most prominent overtone into a coherent relationship with the fundamental. And you can hear the difference. I'm, I'm hoping this microphone will help here. Okay. Here are two notes played without any overtone tuning done. So here it is with the out of whack overtones. Oops. <laughs> now the main note I'm hearing is bum, bum. Right? I don't know if you can hear that. Dum, dum. But there's also a fairly prominent high note in there. It's sort of like. I'm not going to talk about that. Can you hear a high note mixed in there? And it doesn't have a very sensible relationship with the music. If you are listening to this in a complicated musical environment where there's lots of instruments playing, it might be that, that your ear would start following the high note instead of the one it's supposed to follow, and it would be a mess. It would be musically confusing. Here's one where I've tuned the, the overtone. Now that high note is three octaves above the fundamental, and the tone is much more clear compared to... because it doesn't have that unwanted note in there. So this is something you can do if you're an instrument maker. You, if you're play, making an instrument that isn't a string instrument, that whose overtones are automatically in tune, you can think, well, uh, maybe I should tune the overtones. Some kinds of instruments are amenable to it, like this one. Um, some of you may not be able to see. I'll admit this so you can see a little bit. This is like a giant kalimba, a giant version of what I was just playing. It's usually called a rumba box. In the Caribbean, they make these. Somehow this instrument made it across the, across the Atlantic with the slave trade, not to the United States, but into the Caribbean. And it's all through the Caribbean, often very big like this. There are base kalimbas all over the Caribbean. And, and they're called marimbulas in Spanish-speaking islands and rumba boxes in English-speaking islands. What I did with this one is I tuned the overtones so that the most prominent overtone is three octaves above the fundamental. And I did another thing. I added a rattle to the times, just for fun. And the rattle doesn't really bring out the fundamental. It brings out that overtone. So it would be a mess if I had untuned overtones and that rattle bringing out even more the sound that you don't want but I tuned the overtone, so now this rattle is bringing out the overtones in a nice way. Let me see if I can get this going. Okay. Sorry. Can you distinguish the rattle tone?
an example of uh, the tuning of overtones. Um, oh, yes, all right. Here's another example. Again, with the idea of prongs which are held rigidly at one end. Here's a piece of steel. It vibrates pretty nicely, except that it's so slender that when it vibrates, you can see it vibrating, you can't hear much. And the reason is because it, uh, it's so slender that it hardly pushes any air when it vibrates. The, it has hardly any surface area. You could say it doesn't have a sound board. So if it doesn't push any air to speak of, we're not going to hear much. It could have a very exciting inner vibratory life, but we wouldn't know because we can't hear it. <laughs> However, uh, I have a, uh, a monitoring system here. I hope I've got the volume right. This, this may be a little loud. What you're hearing now is... It's a funny noise machine. So, let me show you a couple things about this that have to do with what we've been talking about. Um, this thing, when it vibrates like this, uh, excuse me, when it vibrates like this, I don't know if you can see very well. You can't hear anything, but the whole thing is vibrating like this. But it's vibrating so slowly that um, it doesn't produce any audible pitch. That's lower than any frequency that we can hear. It's vibrating practically so slow that you could count each vibration. That's too slow to hear. If I shorten it, the frequency gets higher, and it gets to where you can hear it. Now, one thing I can do, though, by plugging it in a slightly different way, there are tones that you can hear. What are those tones? Well, that's one of the overtones. The fundamental is so slow you can't hear it, but the overtones are in a frequency range that you can hear. And if I plot this like this and shorten it while I go, the pitch is getting higher. An interesting thing is going to happen. The overtone that your ear focuses on is going to get higher and higher and higher and higher. And your ear is focusing on it simply because it's right in the middle of the hearing range. That's what you can hear easily. As it gets higher and higher, it's going to go up and up and up till where it's starting to get beyond the happy part of the hearing range. But meanwhile, some other overtone, because there's a whole string of overtones in this thing, some lower overtone is going to start finding its way up into the hearing range, and you'll start hearing that one. And this will happen several times as you go along. There will be a series of tones that sort of pass through the window of the hearing range, if you can picture what I'm saying. They start too low to be heard, they start getting higher, they get into the range that our ears can hear, and then they get too high, then we can't hear them anymore. And then another one that was lower comes up and passes through. And they overlap to some extent, too. And the interesting thing is to listen to this very carefully and notice when your ear stops focusing on overtone A and starts picking up on overtone B. It happens unconsciously unless you really listen carefully. So I'm going to do this exercise. I'm going to pluck it along, make it get shorter and shorter. I'd like you to listen to hear what tone you're focusing on, listen to it get higher, and see if you can notice the moment when your ear stops focusing on the one that's gotten too high and starts focusing on his younger brother coming up from below. Some of them, the vibration is so slow you can't hear them any, anyway. 
this thing, this thing, this really is a fun instrument. Let me just take a minute and show you some cool things that it can do. <laughs>
plot these, they'll just be the regular uh, first mode of vibration. That means the whole thing, the whole rod, the whole prong, whatever you call it, just going like this. When I plot these, it's a little hard to see, but I'm creating, I'm plucking them in a funny way which causes them to vibrate in a way that's more like, it goes back and forth between this shape and, uh, how can I, it's hard to describe, but it, it, it's sort of going like this, and it, with a pivot point right about here. That's what it's doing when I, I'm doing it a special way, to, uh, plucking it a special way to make that happen. And the third thing is I just pluck it very sharply down near the base, and that excites yet another mode of vibration. So I get the three sounds from the same kind of sounding object. Okay, now this is the thing I should have done first, but I didn't because when I was done, I wouldn't have had any friends left. <laughs> We're on to another topic now. frequency counters, but you did have a bunch of scientists asserting that musical pitch, how high or low a note was, corresponds to how rapid a vibration is. How are you going to demonstrate that idea to your 19th century physics classroom if you don't, you know, if you don't have an oscilloscope to do it, if you don't have a frequency counter, if you can't go on the computer or buy the right software. Um, and one of the methods to do this was created by a guy named Felix Savard. I only knew this after I had designed and built this instrument. That there was this character named Felix Savard who had built something that was essentially this, but a one-note version. What it is is, what he made was a cog wheel, one cog wheel, which would rotate, and then you would hold something like a car, a stiff, some stiff anything, like a playing card or anything else, against the thing as the cogs went by. And the cogs would go by at however many cogs per second, depending on how fast it's vibrating. And if, it were, if there were uh, 440 cogs going by per second, you would notice that you would hear the note that we think of as A above middle C, which corresponds to the frequency of 440 vibrations per second. In other words, what he made was a way of demonstrating that as this card is being agitated, getting so many hits per second, that corresponds to pitch. It was a very clear demonstration of the idea that the faster the frequency, the higher the note you hear. So, not knowing that Felix Sauer had ever done this, I built this thing which is, has all the pitches of a chromatic scale over a couple of octaves. This is just, these are these discs all adjacent to one another. One disc is bigger than another. If you think about it, this largest disc, if they're, when they're all rotating at, you know, 10 rotations per second or however many the whole thing does, there's a lot more ridges going by on this big disc than on this little disc, because it has to get all its 500 ridges to go by, and the same time this one only needs to get its you know, 80 ridges, whatever it might be, whatever it might be. And it turned out to be uh, arithmetic for deciding how large to make each of the discs to get the right number of ridges. That arithmetic is fairly simple. So we get this thing. Some number of ridges going by, and this 
the, the, I'm holding this against the ridges. It gets a shake every time a ridge goes by. It translates its shape to this cup, which looks mysterious, but all it is is a, a radiating surface, in other words, a soundboard, to send more sound out into the air. I could have used a playing card myself. So there's Savard's wheel. kind of distortion, really. I mean, the effect is that the, the pattern of vibration is very angular. In a, so if you graph the pattern of vibration, you'd see a very angular graph. You get what's called clipping. Uh, and these guys were getting all the girls. So, <laughs> so I, I, this is not a true story, though. No. <laughs> I said to myself, in my, this imaginary story, story, gee, how can I create an angular waveform? <laughs> and this really, this, if you think about the way that the, the plectrum here rides over those ridges, you can imagine it's a very jerky kind of motion. And it creates that really angular pattern of movement, that really edgy pattern of movement. And so you can out Hendrix Hendrix with this thing, without <laughs> having to spend so much time in the black practice. Okay, let me do, uh, how are we doing? Uh, let me do just one more quick little thing. It has nothing to do with anything, but it's fun. This is a, a wind instrument. Now, we heard some reed instruments a moment ago. Whenever you have a wind instrument, most wind instruments take the form of a tube and some way of setting up an oscillation in that tube. And the length of the tube will determine the frequency of the oscillation that, that gives you your pitch. Um, you can set up the oscillation using a reed. You can set it up in the way that flutes do, which involves blowing over an edge. Same with blowing over the edge of a Coke bottle. It, it creates a kind of eddying effect in the air as it goes over the edge. And the tube, the, uh, the frequency the tube wants to oscillate comes to dominate that eddying effect. And, and you get a clear pitch. You don't need an air gate for that. Flutes work different. They have. Here's something that's not a reed and it's not a flute. It's a set of corrugated tubes. This is an instrument that couldn't have been invented a hundred years ago because they weren't making corrugated flex tubes then. It turns out when you when air rushes through a corrugated tube like this, as it trap as it bumps over those corrugations, it will set up a standing wave inside the tube. Uh, and what frequency will that standing wave be? Well it's some interaction between the frequencies that the tube wants to do, that's the natural frequency of the tube like we've been talking about, and the rate at which the air is bumping over corrugations. So that the faster you blow, remember that these tubes have a bunch of overtones. There's not just one note, it can play a series of notes. The faster you blow, it will set up a vibration at the closest frequency that the tube wants to do. Did I say it clearly enough? If, if you blow very slowly, it will, it will then set up a vibration at one of the lower overtones of the tube because it's bumping over the corrugation more slowly. If you speed up your air, it will stay at that note for a minute, but it, later, as it speeds up more, it will jump to the next overtone. Because it's bumping over the corrugations faster. So it will jump from overtone to overtone to overtone. <coughs> this is an instrument that uses that principle. One thing about these overtones is it's not like a scale. You don't get do, re, mi when you do these overtones. You get much more widely spaced pitches. So this instrument has four tubes. Each has its overtones. And they're all different lengths. And between the four of them, you get all the notes you want. They sort of fill in the blank spaces for each other between the overtones, if you can picture that. So between the four overtones, I get a complete scale with this thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to blow. I'm covering all four of these tubes. When I want a tube to sound, I lift my finger. Then the air can pass through, and that tube will sound.
Uh, and you can hear, I'll, I'll just do this with one of the tools. If I blow, I'll blow, start blowing slowly and then I'll blow a little faster and you'll hear it jump from note to note. Mm. A lot of people are doing fun things with these corrugated tubes. Okay, I'm going to stop there and we, have, and we do have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Um, your stringed instrument in the long box sounds very much like gamelan. And I wonder uh, if a similar instrument is used in Indonesia. And that is a very, very good observation. Uh, gamelan orchestras are very much characterized by the use of a lot of gongs. I mean, they have some strings, but they sound much more like conventional string. They use a lot of gongs uh, and different forms of gongs and chimes, and, and as well as some marimba-like things, um, but metal, metal marimba-like instruments. And those are instruments that tend to have inharmonic overtone content. So your observation is right, spot on. I, I distorted the overtone content of the strings. It started to sound more like gamelan instruments, which are inharmonic instruments. Uh, have you studied any of the Appalachian instruments? You know, I, I mean, I, I, it's my job to sort of be aware of these things, but I haven't studied them well. And there, there's a world of people who really have, but it's not me. Would you turn that instrument this way so we can see what it looks like in the front, so the camera can pick it up too? This one? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, you know, it's just a series of discs. This is the biggest disc, smaller, 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 going all the way to the other end. <coughs> Put adjacent to each other. This is on a spindle. I have a cultural question. They showed a, a, a documentary here of these caves they found in France, I think, some 10,000 years ago, people. They found a bone with four holes in it, which they said was an early flute. The guy picked it up and played the Star Spangled Banner on it. Does that mean that Western music has a diatonic scale that's 10,000 years old? And other cultures who use other scales didn't develop that way? You know, I love that movie, and I objected to that. I objected to that moment in it. Um, because, uh, first of all, it's really presumptuous to sort of imply that they used our scale. Um, and there's enough pitch bendability in something like that, especially a very small flute like that, you can really bend the pitch, to, that you can make it conform close enough to, to convince a movie audience that is, that is a particular scale. But he, he, was, he was conforming it. it. The data of the placement of the whole tone holes is not enough to reach the conclusion that he implied. That was my opinion when I read it. And this question of how old scales are, um, if, you, if you have, uh, if you want to take three or four years um, and go back and get another PhD, you could look into that question. It's very, the, the, the nature of scale structure and how our ears dictate our scales, how we arrive at scales culturally, is a, is a fascinating question and one which you could devote a life to study. Yes, I was wondering how the Chinese scales that we hear, so, and they're so different to our ears, relate to what you've been showing us here. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't studied Chinese scales enough to answer that, you know, in a technical way. A lot of Chinese music uses uh, certain kinds of pentatonic scales. Those are five note scales. We tend to use a scale where we have a choice of 12 notes, but we usually only use seven at a time. And some of those Chinese pentatonic scales are fairly close to scales that we can use, and some of them aren't. And some of the exoticness of that music may stem more from the tone quality of the instruments than from the scales, especially the vocal music where they tend to use a very different kind of tonal production than we use. So, you know, these scale, scale questions really are, they're very rich, and they also quickly get very complicated. Uh -huh. A question, uh, learning how instruments work, typically, if you, once you get the idea of how an instrument works, whether you created the instrument yourself or whether somebody else did, 
is to finally be able to make music with that instrument when you're done. Have you done any work uh, with all the instruments you created to create some music, whatever might interest you? Um, well, do you want do you want the, do you want the CD pitch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, you can go to barthopkin.com. Is that set up? Or, well, it might be better if you go to windworld.com and go to the. Uh, Go to the um, what's it called the, the the catalog section, and you can. I've done a few CDs, so you, you if, well I'll, I will do a pitch for my website. There, there's a website. My name is Bart Hopkin without the S, and there's a website called barthopkin.com. If you go there and go to invented instruments, you can hear a lot of my instruments. Uh, and then there are CDs for sale at that website. I think that's set up currently, and I think it's got a catalog or something placed there if you're interested. So remember BarnHopkin.com, and if you feel like it and enjoy it, you can see photographs of a whole lot of my instruments and hear sound samples. And if you're interested, go to the catalog and pick up a CD. What kind of music is your favorite? <laughs> you mean today or yesterday or something? <laughs> you, really, you really have to be open-minded. In a world full of snobs, it's really good to, you know, to be open-minded and flexible. Is that a good enough answer? <laughs> I have a personal question. I'm over here. A personal question. And oh, that is, how old were you when you knew this was what you were going to do for the rest of your life? And what was it that turned you on? You know, I think a lot of kids play with sound. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I bet if I asked for a show of hands, I bet a, a good number of people in this room would remember lining up the glasses on the counter on Sunday morning when your parents were trying to sleep and putting different amounts of water in them. Yeah. And so I did, I did do all that. When I was in college, um, and there was a, a, a visiting professor, who was a famous guy, the, the, the Charles Seeger, the father of Pete Seeger, happened to be doing a visiting professorship at my school. And um, I somehow went to the chairman of the department and said, I want to do an independent study. And he said, oh, get Charles Seeger to do it. He can't hear anyway. He was, he, was, he was very old at that time, and he was almost entirely deaf. And so I did an independent study with this famous guy who, who could hardly hear what I was saying to him. And the independent study was I wanted to write a, a research paper on a topic that I call creative organology. Organology is the, an academic term for the study of musical instruments. And this was the, uh, the idea that you can make instruments in a way that aren't imitative, but that are creative and original. And I wrote this whole paper for him. I don't know if you read it. He, he gave me an A- minus because there was grade inflation, and that was the most neutral grade he could give. <laughs> and, but that paper was really important for me, because I went on working with that idea and still work with it. Listening to uh, some of your music, I couldn't help but wonder, I would ask this question, are you a fan of PDQ Bach? <laughs> <laughs> He's done some great stuff. Yes, yes I am. The only one PDQ Bach, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's a musical, uh, spoofer, I don't know what word to use, but he, and he does, he, he used to just do spoofs of Baroque music, a la ba. He'd, do, he'd some way doing something that sets your ear up for a Baroque treatment of some piece of music, then he'd do something very modern that would make you laugh, or so he did all kinds of things. But he also did some funny things like take the music stands that are ubiquitous in the world in which he moves, stick a oboe reed on it, they by the way happen to have a telescoping mechanism, you know, so he'd be making a slide oboe he did that kind of stuff. Great guy. What's his proper name? I can't think of his name. What's his Peter name? Schickle. Peter Schickle. Peter Schickle. The uh, small drum reed one, mm -hmm. can you extend the range of that by adding a longer pipe? I could, but I didn't want to because the, uh, I wanted to do something different. The usual situation with a reed instrument is that the air column dominates the reed. I wanted to create something where I had a big, very flexible reed, which, which was not dominated by an air column, and then I could sort of then mess with the reed hands-on and see if that would prove to be a fruitful thing to do. So that's why I didn't do that. But like I said, check with me again in, in six weeks, and I'll, we'll see how it's going. A question about uh, how your instruments are being used professionally um, in orchestras or by popular musicians? Uh, you know, that question gets at another question, which is, 
how do we think about musical instruments? And I'll, be, I'll try to be really quick about this. You can think of musical instruments as pre-existing types, like violin, guitar, and so forth. Or you can think about them as one of a kind, the way you think, let's say, of a sculpture. If you think of them as pre-existing types, a lot of things follow from that. You can create a whole culture around a musical instrument, a pool of skilled players, a repertoire, uh, a general understanding of what kinds of things this instrument can do, Composi uh, uh, compositions that, for the instrument and that kind of thing. If it's a one of a kind, none of that can exist, and it's not in the same way. So I kind of said, I'm on the sculpture side of things, and I don't... I don't invent an instrument and say, I'm going to be like Adolf Sachs, inventor of the saxophone, and create an instrument that many people will play. I'm going to try and create a one-of-a-kind. I will enjoy it. Maybe I'll put it in somebody else's hands. But it's, I'm not going to seek that kind of success. I'm going to, I'm going to look for something else. And, uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll just leave it at that. So, so I see, yeah, some other people have played my instruments, but I haven't really pursued that for that, for that reason. Any other questions? Mark, thank you for such a great presentation.